Today on Prophecy Focus, we will examine prophetic Babylon, the headquarters of the future Antichrist. I'm Dr. Richard Schmidt, founder of Prophecy Focus Ministries and pastor at Union Grove Baptist Church in Union Grove, Wisconsin. I'm Pastor John, discipleship pastor at Brookside Baptist Church in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Well, John, it's good to see you again. Long time no see. Long time no see. And uh, I'm excited again, and I say that every program, but I'm always excited because we're studying the Word of God, we're looking at prophecy, and I just love this. Well, this is such a neat topic because it spans from Genesis to Revelation. So much is connected to the city of Babylon. We're seeing the influences today, and we're going to see it in the future. Absolutely. Well, John, you mentioned, uh, and we're both pastors of different churches, and uh, we just meld together and work together great. And uh, uh, real quick, where is Brookside Baptist Church? It's in uh, Brookfield, Wisconsin, which was probably 15, 20 minutes uh, west of Milwaukee. All right, and uh, Unigrove Baptist Church is about 25 minutes south of Milwaukee. So uh, we're distant neighbors. <laughs> yes. So uh, uh, folks, if you, you're looking for a good church, we always recommend uh, uh, our doors are wide open. We always love to see folks come in. And uh, again, we're about 25 minutes south of Milwaukee in the Racine area. So Kenosha, Milwaukee, Racine, all those counties are welcome to come. Yeah, and if you do come, please call us up. Let us know you're coming in advance. And if you show up, find us. We want to say hello and uh, greet you with a warm hug. Hug? Hug. These days, All yes. Right. Well, I give a handshake. So <laughs> or a handshake. If you or want a to fist do, pump. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into our topic today. We just want you to know that uh, we love folks and we do this program because we not just love prophecy and, and enjoy teaching those, the scriptures, but we love people. And a lot of the things that we discuss here are specifically given to try and help people in their walk with Christ and to help folks that, quite frankly, have no relationship with Jesus. They're not sure if they died, they go to heaven. We always like to bring that into the program as well. Absolutely. God commands us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no better way to grow in the knowledge than to study God's Word. Absolutely. Well, here at Prophecy Focus, what we love to say is we peel God's prophetic Word one passage at a time. Again, a thousand prophecies in Scripture, 500 fulfilled, have been fulfilled exactly as stated, meaning 500 more to come. And we're going to be looking at a, a, a significant number of prophecies that God made absolutely perfectly clear, as they say, uh, will come to pass exactly as written. That's what's great about studying scriptures. The Bible prophecies are so specific that when they occur, you can definitely say God predicted it in the past. All right, so our series, our six, our six point series, if you will, uh, is going to be on and is on the future rise and fall of Babylon the Great. So again, these are prophetic messages talking about things to come. Today we're going to center in on uh, basically Antichrist future headquarters. Now, John, that's, that's a, something that gets our attention. It's a fun topic. People really want to know about the Antichrist. Who's he going to be? What's going to happen? Where's he going to have his headquarters? And today we're going to answer at least one of those questions. Yeah, scriptures give us quite a few details on who this Antichrist is, what's he going to do, where he's going to live, how he's going to operate. Absolutely. So this is, it's a great topic and one that has a tremendous amount of interest. One of the things that many people try to do, and when we do call-in programs and so forth, uh, people will call in and say, well, do you think so-and-so is going to be the Antichrist? Uh, just this week I had that happen. A, la a dear lady called in and says, well, I think this person might be the Antichrist. John, I don't know about you. What do you think about speculation as to who the Antichrist is going to be? Well, the scriptures seem to tell us that we should be aware and we should be ready. But our focus is to purify ourselves as he is pure. Our focus should be on the gospel and our sanctification. Speculating, hey, fun to have around a dinner table, always mm -hmm. important to think about, but don't let that be your priority. All right, I agree with that. Uh, trying to figure out who the Antichrist is has been a pastime of Christians for 2,000 years. <laughs> and, and let me add, we look foolish because mm. how many of you have been told a person was the Antichrist, B person Antichrist, and now enough time has passed where that wasn't true. We look foolish when we start speculating on things we cannot know. All right, and I 100% back that statement up. All right, so 
Let's get into Revelation 17. If you have a Bible, pick it up. Let's go there. Revelation se uh, chapter 17. We're going to go through about the first six or seven verses on this particular program. And we're going to be talking about future Babylon. Now, if you, if you go to a map right now and you look up Babylon, unless it's a, a more of an older script, if you will, you're not going to find a whole lot. So, But God makes it perfectly clear that in the future, a place called Babylon is going to rise up and actually be the headquarters of the one world dictator known as the Antichrist. So, John, let's go to Revelation 17 and uh, let's go to verse 1 and look at the receiver uh, of this judgment, specifically Babylon. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, Babylon, who sits on many waters. That's world dominance. All right. So here we have the introduction to the fall of a city that, quite frankly, right now is a non-entity in our world. How long does it take a nation to rise up? Well, if you've got the right money, if you've got the right uh, people, if you've got the right leadership in today's modern world, it can rise up pretty fast. So God is making it perfectly clear that there is going to be, if you will, a revived Babylon, a place where uh, it's going to literally have <coughs> world dominant, dominance. Let's go to verse 2. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, spiritual adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. All right, so we have some symbolic uh, terms here. We need to understand what is happening here. Babylon, as we looked at in our first program on this and gave the historical background from Genesis, Babel, where the Tower of Babel was, was run by a person named Nimrod. John, maybe a little historical issue about who was Nimrod. Yeah, Nimrod is a very unique individual. We said he's the great-grandson of Noah. So you could see as the great-grandson of Noah, hey, I'm a descendant of Noah. I mean, you could see that play. But when we get to that Genesis passage, this is what it says. He's described three times as a mighty man. Now, this term can mainly mean a manly man, vigorous, but it also can be a despot, uh, a tyrannical, violent leader. In fact, if you study that word, it sometimes can describe one who hunts. And think about Nimrod. He has set up these amazing, violent countries, uh, Babel and Acadia and so forth. And these countries were known as a violent, oppressive people. So this is the spirit of the Antichrist. I really believe that. He is going to be a manhunter. He's going to be violent. He's going to be tyrannical. He is going to be a dangerous individual. So what we're saying is, in, in my simplistic terms, that was a great analysis. When you look at Genesis, when you look at 3000 B.C., when Nimrod came on the scene, now we're going from Genesis all the way across the 66 books of the Bible to Revelation. And in chapter 4, verse 2, all the way through chapter 19, verse 10, is talking about all future events during the tribulation period. What we're saying is that exactly the, the mother-son uh, cult that existed between Semiramis and Tammuz and Nimrod, which took place 3000 B.C., a similar scenario is going to rise up in the prophetic future yet, mimicking that. Absolutely. In fact, go to Daniel chapter 11, 21 through 35. That seems to appear that we're speaking about Antiochus or Antiochus. And then you go to Daniel 11, 36 through 45, which moves now to the Antichrist. And so we get another picture of this character of the Antichrist through this lens of the past. And I tell you, you know, thank the Lord that he's given us this prophecy so that we know what to do. But as believers in this age, we won't face the Antichrist. We'll have been raptured. Mm -hmm. We will be judged in the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be waiting to return to rule and reign. All right. Excellent summary again. Well, let's go to verse 3 in Revelation chapter 17, if you have your Bibles open. And here's what it said. Now, we're going to get into some of these terms that require some significant look. There's several different opinions on some of these things. But John, and I think uh, you and I definitely agree on where this passage is going. And uh, let's see if we can dissect it a bit. So Revelation chapter uh, 17, verse 3 says this. So he carried me in the way in the spirit into the wilderness. 
and I saw a woman. Now, uh, when you uh, see the verse on uh, our screen right now, we're filling in the blanks to try and help us understand what these words are speaking to. John, if we were doing a sermon on this, we'd probably spend a good hour on this one passage. You know, this picture of a woman, you got to contrast it with the bride of Christ. Mm. And that'll help you more understand what's being communicated by John the Apostle because you couldn't look at more of an opposite. The church is supposed to be clean and uh, holy and spotless and beautiful and faithful to God or faithful to Christ, his, her groom. And here we have Babylon, the world, the spiritual adulterer. It, you couldn't have more of a greater contrast. All right, why does God use human terms to describe if you will, biblical principles and prophetic things. It's because me and you think in her human terms. So when he talks about, if you will, a harlot or a, in more of our terms, a prostitute, you get a mental picture of what that encompasses. It's a person, if you will, that, and with all due respect, uh, to people that take part in that type of a profession, or if you will, but uh, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not looked upon with favor. It's looked upon by God as something that shouldn't take place. So we look at that and, and it becomes, oh, God is looking at this revived Babylon as someone, if you will, who is involved in activity they really shouldn't be involved in. It's interesting that he uses a woman because of the spiritual adulterous side. And we see this, this concept, like for example, in Proverbs chapter nine, I'm teaching Proverbs in Sunday school mm. at our church. And in Proverbs nine, you have, you have lady wisdom personified, mm. contrasted with mistress folly. Uh -huh. And so we see this all throughout scriptures, these pictures to help us understand the literal. All right, so let's look through this. And again, if you have your Bible, this is one of those things where you might wanna get your pen out and make some notes. So again, it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman who we're gonna describe as Babylon sitting on a scarlet beast. So we've got a woman, we've got a beast. And if you look at the corner right now of, a, of the verse on our screen, you'll see basically an artist's rendition of that, uh, which was full of names of blasphemy. So this obviously is not a good thing. This is a blasphemous anti-God uh, situation we're looking at. Now we look at this beast that the uh, Babylon is basically sitting on, and what do we look at? Uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns. Now, John, here's where the the people have gone. Many different scholars, many different interpreters of the Bible. They've gotten a million different, well, not a million, but several different major uh, comprehension of what this means. So John, and, and you and I both agree on this, and that's why we also have it listed on the verse that we're showing. Here's what we're looking at. What are these seven heads with 10 horns? And it's actually, when we get down into our, our next program next week, it actually points out and spells it out a little bit clearer. But for sake of folks watching right now, John, what are these seven heads? heads referring to? Well, you need to look at all the scriptures and it, there's only one thing that the scriptures seem to point to and that's seven nations, mm. significant nations. And I want to differentiate here because it really is seven empires. Mm. America is not an empire. We don't, well, we may act in empirish ways, but we are not an empire in the sense that Egypt was or Babylon or Rome or Greece, where we went in and we literally conquered, took over and took their lands and now is all under our authority. America is not an empire. We are unique in this way. So I believe if you look at scriptures, those represent seven major kingdoms. All right, so when we go back to Genesis in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham comes on the scene who has a son named Abraham as Isaac, who has a son named Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. What is the first major empire that affects the, if you will, the Hebrew children, the children of Israel? Egypt. From Egypt, the next major empire is Assyria, then Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome. And you say, well, wait a second, what comes after Rome? Where's the next one? Well, folks, that's be, why is God not referring to what's taking place right now in the world? Well, here's the exact reason why it stopped with Rome, is because when the church age began, 
the issue of who's affecting the Jewish people is muted until after the rapture. And the seventh kingdom that is talked about in Revelation, talked in other passages of Scripture, talks about in Daniel 2 is the operative passage for this. In Daniel chapter 2, it talks about a, a, a empire that is made out of iron, which refers to Rome. We know this historically. There's no doubt about that. In the future, then, this seventh kingdom that will rise up is, uh, if you will, the feet of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, made up uh, partially of iron, which is Rome, and then clay. So the revived Roman Empire is coming. It is a future entity. Now, John, there's multiple passages that uh, talk about ten something, ten toes, ten horns. What do these ten things, do they exist today or is this future? Well, it certainly is future, and the scriptures make this abundantly clear. We're talking about ten significant leaders during the tribulation that are going to be connected to the Antichrist. All right, we're going to see that as we develop these passages. All right, let's, uh, let's jump down to verse 4, Revelation 17, and see if we can develop this a little more. And it says, the woman, and again, we're going to describe that as Babylon, and you say, well, how can you say that? Well, you've got to just stick with us. We're, this is going to develop as we move along, and we'll back it up. The woman or Babylon was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of what? abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. John, when we look at this description before we get down to the golden cup, we're talking about purple and scarlet and gold. Now, that doesn't sound to me like a poor person. No, these terms are very specific. If you study them throughout the scriptures, they are connected to royalty, right? Mm. Wealth, economic power. They're also connected to religious as well, because if you look at the tabernacle and how it was built, some of these elements are in there. So you're seeing religious, you're seeing economic, and we're also seeing political. Because this filthiness of fornication, clearly that's dealing with spiritual uh, adultery. So you're getting an insight from God of this unique Babylon that's going to rise up and have these three elements. All right, so tremendous power, tremendous wealth, tremendous control, and the operative thing here is it's filthy. Yeah. It's full of abominations. It's anti-God. It's all about the Antichrist. And of course, if we went to Revelation 13, the three key players that will be around at that time, Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, the satanic false trinity, they will rise up and literally control the world and have tremendous dominance. And in God's eyes, he looks at it as a filthy, abominable, fornicating group. Yeah, because they're not believers. They haven't been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so you're seeing the culmination of man's sin in this system. Wow. This is disturbing, folks, and I know it's disturbing, uh, but we're going to give you some uh, good news in just a moment. Let's go to the major verse here, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. John, why don't you take it? And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, John, this is where we get into a lot of folks that look at this and all of a sudden the uh, uh, allegorical and spiritualizing start to kick in. And there's lots of different opinions on what is Mystery Babylon the Great. Well, we're going to give uh, basically uh, uh, an opinion in a few moments, but let's go through some of the controversial issues with this. Now, I want you to pay attention, if you will, to the concept of mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, uh, uh, Brother Rich. I happen to know, I know Greek, and uh, there's no punctuation in the Bible. And they're absolutely right. And you look at the, the interpretation in, in certain Bibles and you'll find mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. In other words, everything about this Babylon is a total mystery. Or uh, uh, there's, without the comma, it's, it's simply, what is mystery, comma? In other words, the, the, there's a mystery, mystery concept of this, but it's about Babylon the Great. All right, so John, uh, we put a couple of things out there. 
some people think Babylon is Rome. Some people look at ba the Babylon as being America or Russia or China. And then there's a few folks that actually think Babylon means Babylon. <laughs> how, do, how do we dissect this? Boy, well, first thing you have to do is you've got to go back to your hermeneutic. Are you going to approach the Bible consistently, historically, grammatically, grammatically literally? In other words, what's going on in the text? This word mystery is a really significant word. Throughout the scriptures, Paul uses it, and he uses it in a very precise way. Now, this is the Apostle John, but this word typically means I'm revealing something now that wasn't revealed before. For example, the church was a mystery. Hmm. The mystery, uh, there's a several other ones uh, in the scriptures that do this. Um, in fact, let me just pull a couple other ones. The mystery of the, the lawless one, that's another mystery. And so these things were hidden and now they're being revealed. And so I think this specific word is John is showing, hey, this mystery of Babylon, we are now going to unveil it, reveal it for what it really is. It's been behind the scenes. There's been signs and hints and messages, but now it's being revealed. All right. So let me just give where we stand on this by going to a couple of things. So when we look at Babylon as it existed back in Genesis, where was it? Well, we know that, and, and we're going to modern day terms, we all know where Israel is, or at least most people do. And then we also are very familiar with a country called Iraq. Well, in Iraq is actually where Babylon, the historical Babylon existed, and the ruins are still there today. A little bit north of that is a, a place that most people are familiar with based on mainly terrorism and issues that are taking place in the Middle East known as Baghdad. So we have Baghdad and just a little bit south of that, a place called Babylon. Now, if we go back to an artist's rendition of what ancient Babylon would have looked like, this, uh, what you're looking at is very similar probably to how it would have looked. Interesting, if you look at kind of the uh, silverish gold or grayish building in the middle, that's the gate of Ishtar, the gate of Ishtar basically was for the pagan religions that existed at that time. You see the ziggurat on the right of, uh, of the picture, which was what uh, uh, Nimrod basically had attempted to build to get up to God. So we have ancient Babylon, which existed in what is commonly known as Iraq, was a definitely true place and a historical place. Yeah, in fact, you can go to Berlin and you can actually see the gates of Ishtar in one of the museums. Absolutely. All right, well, let's go through a couple of pictures here which kind of help us explain this. In this particular scenario, we're looking at Saddam Hussein's palace. His palace was literally overlooking the ruins of ancient Babylon. So he was in literally the, the place called Babylon. Now, Saddam Hussein was attempting to build it back up. He was attempting to recreate Babylon. And uh, God said, nope, it's not time yet, and allowed uh, uh, the American government basically to take uh, Saddam Hussein down. Uh, we look at uh, uh, Babylon today. This is basically what it looks like. There, there's not much there. It's not, it certainly doesn't sound like what's described in the Bible. So, John, we have to kind of decipher, is indeed Babylon going to be resurrected or are we talking about something else? Well, I think we have to take the Bible uh, at its face value. And it clearly is describing a physical city that exists. I do want to back up a little bit. If we look at Nimrod, he set up uh, quite a few nations. And to the north, he set up Nineveh, which I think is one of the significant ones. And to the south, he set up Babylon. Mm. And so this man, Nimrod, great grandson of, of Noah, has created these major nations, but this Babylon is unique. And so I do believe in the future, we're going to see a literal Babylon. In fact, I would check out Andy Wood. He's been keeping up on how this area is growing and being redeveloped. And so there are some fascinating uh, things that are going on. In fact, UNESCO, which goes around the world and declares things protected, Babylon is now under UNESCO's protection. Hmm. All right, well, thanks for bringing that up. Let's move ahead a little bit. We've got uh, another verse and a half to get through here. In uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, now it states, I saw the woman, or Babylon, this mother of harlots, this mother of abominations, drunk with the blood of the saints. John, I constantly get asked this question in prophecy conferences, and I'm not quite sure why it's not well known, 
But uh, the question comes up, will there be people that will come to Christ during the tribulation, period? And what, what's your answer to that? Absolutely, yes. You have the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 for each tribe. They're going to evangelize their own people. You have the two witnesses who will be broadcasting the whole world. There will be people saved, and it will be a scary time for them. It will, because as soon as someone comes to Christ, they refuse to worship the Antichrist, as will be demanded in Revelation 13. Unless they can somehow manage to go underground and protect their lives, they will be martyred. So this place called Babylon will be risen up. It'll be drunk with the blood of the saints, which is during that seven-year tribulation period, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Well, let's close with uh, this prophetic piece, Matthew chapter 24. And John, if you can quickly get us through uh, a couple of verses in Jesus' Olivet Discourse regarding what's going to happen during this horrible time period. Yeah, Matthew 24, verse 9 through 12. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. All right, now that's a terrible thing to end a program on, so we're not going to end there. This is future. Not one single person watching us today needs go through what has been described here, which will definitely take place. How, if you will, do you escape this horrible time to come where Babylon and the Antichrist will, where the headquarters of the Antichrist will be? How do you stay away from that? How do you escape it? Jesus Christ made it absolutely perfectly clear in the scriptures in John chapter 14, verse 6. Very simple. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there's a coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth to take his children home to escape, if you will, the tribulation and to live with him forever. Now, here's the suggestion. The Bible makes it very clear, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's each one of us, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in him places their faith and trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, if you'll trust in Christ, you can be saved from hell and these things to come. Well, thanks again for watching us on Prophecy Focus.